Welcome back to Mysterious Goings On. So excited to have part two of our conversation with authors Eden Bailey and Jason McIntyre, uh, two very good friends of mine, fantastic writers. I hope you enjoyed last week's episode. If you didn't catch that, get your butt on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you go, and listen to it. Because uh, we're talking about things that we wish readers knew about writers. A lot of it. That seems to be where it's going. But there's some other stuff there. And you're going to want to hear about their takes on the little traps they fall into and tropes they, they use. And things that we use that are crutches and things like that. So go back and listen to that last episode for that. But this week we're going to continue the conversation. So hello, Eden. Hello, Alex. Hello. And Jason, are you still there? I'm here. We were just talking last week about, we talked about, like, as I mentioned in the intro, tropes and traps and things like that and marketing our work. And, and I really loved hearing the way both of you approach your readership. You didn't outright say, this is how I approach my readership. But Jason, for example, you, you put the call out saying, hey, find a mistake, let me know. Uh, what do you like about this? What do you not like about this? I'm a little less open to that. I, Eden, I sense you're not quite are you asking for that kind of thing on your blog? Is that what you said last week? That Are you asking readers to tell you what they like and don't like? Or are you a little more guarded about it? Or, or where were you on that? Um, I think when it comes to my own individual writing, I'm, I'm fine if people comment. I, I think I've grown a much thicker skin right. <laughs> over the years. And so if they find an error in my book, uh, I am happy to have to let for them to let me know. And also I've had discussions with people who send me personal emails uh, saying, you know, I don't like your your use of the word, can I say this word on air, Alex? Go. The C, the C word, I don't like that you use the word cunt, you know, because I wrote erotica. So, um, but I've had those discussions right on my blog. So, you know, it's it's something that I think it's a learning experience for, for people. Um, so why not? You know, it's learning for me as well, because I I have my reasoning for using particular words, and if a reader doesn't like it, I fully respect it because they they are looking at it from a their own point of view. And so then I'll explain why I used it, and maybe we come to some sort of understanding, and that's the best I can hope for. I love that. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I mentioned uh, last week about how, uh, and Jason was very much a part of this, helping revitalize and relaunch my John Pilot mystery series. And one thing we did that Jason did was the, the new covers. Well, I'm catching mostly just humorous heat about, and Jason's probably rolling his eyes, uh, <laughs> I, the pilot's key cover. And I just this morning, a dear friend of mine who loves the series, she she emailed me and said, or t- messaged me and said, you know, I don't think I've read that new John Pilot book, uh, Pilot's Nude Beach. <laughs> 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 if you haven't seen it, Eden, the, the new cover, it's it's a scantily clad woman in a string bikini laying on her belly. Uh, and, and she's basically, for all intents and purposes, nude. And the reason Jason and I went that direction was, well, we're chasing commercial business. We're chasing eyeballs here a little bit. And it was an, a bit of an experiment because the new series of book covers, there's definitely a through line and there's definitely... They're definitely consistent style, and for that particular book, which I've defended a million times the past few weeks, you know that's a very heavy, sandy beach kind of setting in uh, Key West, and there's a lot of sex, and it's a little noir, and so we had some I, fun with it. I absolutely love that cover, and I actually meant to to ask you about this. Have you had any uh, of the online publishers sort of? Um, give nope. you any flack about displaying it. I thought I might. And I remember, Jason, what did I, I asked you about this before we did we, it. Did we I ask were, you? We were fully expecting some of them to have an issue with it. Um, as far as I know, Alex, you can correct me, but I don't think anybody's flagged it nobody's, from that point of view. Nobody's flagged. Well, one thing, I will say this. There was a There is a blog, and the name escapes me now, but they do a monthly. If your paperback is below 15 bucks, you can list it. And you just list it in the comments, and what they do, they'll go in and you, you put the you put the name of the, the book, you put uh, the link to it, and, and your you know the author's name. And what they'll do, they'll go back and they'll change the link into a picture of the book cover for you. And they did it. I listed all my books because they're all under fifteen on the paper bag, and uh, but they did not, and they they did not show the pilot's key cover. Mm. But then I went back and read their thing. They said if it's anything that's it's of erotica or if it's anything that might not be safe for work 
they said we basically tend towards being very conservative, but that's the only thing. The mm. the good thing besides like I just love the cover, and I mean you know I love beautiful women anyway, so I love to look at it. But besides that, is sales are up. Excellent. Yeah, that is good. In terms of um, getting feedback, like Eden was talking about feedback from a reader in a personal email. And Alex, you're talking about uh, a little bit about people maybe teasing you a little bit about the the cover with the beautiful woman on it. I I just wanted to mention, I feel like I've been open to receiving feedback, criticism, bad reviews. I don't love them, of course, but do want to make it clear that I probably am not going to change my artistic or creative impulses. I'm if if a reader comes to me and says that I have Jason McIntyre book that he or she read did something that that reader didn't care for, I'm not going to go and change that. And I'm probably not going to change my approach to doing what I do in the future. I'll probably have a little, uh, you know, a little bird on my shoulder and think about it in a different way. But ultimately, it's probably not going to result in, you know, pandering to any degree, really. That's just the way I look at it, though. What do you guys think? I feel the same way. Absolutely. I mean, if we were if we were taking all the negative reviews or all of the uh, the feedback that we were getting that disagreed with the way we were writing our books or a character, it would no longer be our stories. It would no longer be our storytelling and our characters and our writing, really. So that's where growing a thick skin really does uh, make you a better writer. You have to sort of stick to your guns. It's like I said, you know, people did not like my use of the word cunt, but I love that word. So I'm going to use it in my writing. And if you don't like it, then you don't read my books. But it's not like I use it, you know, for no reason. There's a, there is a purpose for using that word in limited areas of my books. So, you know, I think it's, it's not that I need to defend it, but I think sometimes you have to know your, your, your books well enough to say, I get it, you don't like it for whatever reason, but, Mm -hmm. you know, it's not going to change the way I write. I love that. Completely agree. Yeah. I was thinking about Stephen King again. He comes to mind because, well, he's ubiquitous, so why not? And and I'm a big fan of reading his book on writing, which is a nice tome for writers to read. Uh, But I think it was in there, or maybe it was elsewhere, but there was a story about his book, The Dead Zone. He got letters because at the beginning, one of the characters, who is an absolute bastard, kicks a dog to death. And he got letters from people saying, you know, burn in hell, I can't believe you'd write that and all this stuff. And he's like, folks, <laughs> this is a book about a bad guy. Um, bad guys do bad things. This is not the church social. And I'm not going to clean up the language and I'm not going to change yeah. these things. Just like just like Eden, just like you just said. Um, I I commit, I did I did one act of cowardice. I did change something. I'll just, I, I, I will just tell you. In uh, Pilot's Cross, there is a, there's a, there's a sex scene and, oh, I put it out there and I had a reader who somebody I knew and he said, I think he, I think it was gratuitous. This, there was a certain sex act that I described and I slept on it for about a week. And then I thought, you know, I think he's right. It doesn't advance the story. And so I went ahead and removed it and I, I don't regret it really because I do think that it, I was right about it. Didn't, it didn't move the story, but, but on the same token, I, I guess I was a little cowardly to do that because I thought it was important to, and it got through all the way to the publication of the book. But then when I did a revised edition, I, I kind of yanked that section out. I, I'm not saying I did right or did wrong, but it's it's interesting to think about that. But yeah, I have some reviews from people who have given me one-star reviews because it has language in it. Yeah, and life just isn't fair that way. I mean, some people don't like uh, bad language, then don't read my fucking book. I, I suppose I can tell them that. <laughs> well, but, uh, <laughs> it, 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 doesn't it doesn't it drive you crazy? Because it, especially when you're an indie author and every, well, I'll say it, every fucking review counts. And then you have some idiot get on the set. I couldn't even finish it because it had the F word. <sighs> Then, then yeah. I'll refund your money. Move on. Please don't wound the book by giving me a shitty review. Yeah. And, you know, I'm also past that stage where I feel like one bad review is going to tar my reputation or mean that no one's going to buy my book ever or people are going to stop following me. I, I'm really past that right now. So I feel like I... I I feel like most readers are smart enough to look at reviews and sort of get a general consensus that, 
oh, okay, she's got 75 or 80% good reviews, and there's this 2% who really did not like the book. And the reason they didn't like it is because, you know, bad language or whatever. I, I think most readers have the smarts to say, oh, okay, well, you know, I'm not one of those 2%. I'm the, the whatever, the 80%. My math is horrible because that doesn't even <laughs> equal 100. Um, <laughs> hey, it's, you're, you're all about words, not numbers. <laughs> we get it. Uh, and so I, I think it's like when we purchase anything, we sort of go with the majority, you know. Oh, okay, we, we use the reviews or the number of reviews as a guideline. That may not be the only reason that we buy the book, right? But it is a guideline as to is there some quality to this product? So I I think, you know, reviewers, I think some just like to give bad reviews because maybe it gives them some power. Maybe they <laughs> feel like, uh, oh, I, this is the only writing maybe that they do. I don't know. You know, they go and write reviews on, on stuff that they read they don't like. And yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, I think though, I wanted to clarify when I say that, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I laugh it off now in a lot of ways, but the, the, the point is though that when you could clearly see that a couple of, and I've had a couple of those on one of my books, it took it down by like a, a half star. So if there's the people who look and if your book doesn't have five stars, they're not even going to consider it. There's a lot of people like that I know, or four stars at least. So it, it took it down a few notches, which, which bothers me. So if hopefully they're doing what you, you know, the, hopefully with this incredible cover, <laughs> they are looking down and review and reading the one star reviews. And I got to admit every now and then it's kind of fun to read the one star reviews of any product or book or movie or something, because oftentimes it's usually not usually, but it's often crazy people. <laughs> well, I, I was going to say often the, the 2%, they really call themselves out in there. There's my Canadian accent. They call themselves out <laughs> in their own review uh, I mean, I had a re review for a book, and I only had three or four reviews for that book, and one of them was a crazy, and and she or he said something, and it was there was typos, you couldn't really understand the the words in, in the the review, but it was something along the lines of, I seem to recall there being an alien in this one star. <laughs> um, I'm like, well, you didn't read it because there's no alien in it, and if you if you read as poorly as you write, then I don't think people will take your review very seriously. That review is still there, by the way, if anybody wants to go look for it. It's hilarious. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's something we laugh at. So I, I want to say this to, to the listeners who, who do write reviews. First of all, thank you. Even if the yeah. And I've always been one to say, listen, I don't expect a five-star review for anything. And it's, it's not just my own, you know, humble pie kind of attitude or anything. But I don't want people to freeze up and think, oh, gosh, if I don't write him a five-star review, I just better not write one at all. Now, I'd rather you didn't write me a one or two star review. Three stars, okay, I guess. But I mean, I would prefer to have the reviews out there so it, there's proof that people have read it and they can add insights to it and give me some feedback. So, those of you who do write reviews, thank you. Those of you who are listening, and you don't even have to write a review of mine or Eden's or Jason's book, you, but write reviews of books that move you. It's really important to, to the authors, and especially authors who are not making a shit ton of money who are clawing and scratching for every reader they can get. It's huge to have a new review. And I do this, uh, Jason, you know, this, what we did on the, the, the go round of book covers, I lifted some of the better Amazon reviews of just regular folks. And I excerpted those on the back cover of all the new paperbacks. And I, I, I kind of like doing that. Now, I don't have a that, that just doesn't mean I don't have reviews from like blogs and news sources and stuff like that. I have some of those too, but I kind of like the idea of just pulling off uh, these people who actually took the time to write me a review. So I just wanted to add that there that uh, reviews are certainly appreciated. I'm pretty sure you guys will agree with me on that. One hundred percent. Reviews always help. They they add to the total. And th as a reader, not as a writer, but as a reader, when I read a book or watch a movie or anything i don't even really um i don't really delineate what is a five star four star three star book or or piece of work i don't know if i'm different that way but i if i like something it gets the top score for me if it's if we're talking five stars on amazon if i enjoyed a book five stars if i didn't i don't review it oh and that's just that's just the way i do it and i don't know that i've necessarily talked to anybody else who does it that way so people will see a ton of five-star reviews from me. It means I liked it. It means it did something for me. doesn't mean it was necessarily the best. Sometimes it was. Sometimes it was. But uh, yeah, five stars are nothing kind of for me. Sometimes I give it a four if it's like, 
if it's like pretty good. But, yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, so I guess I break my own rules sometimes. Wow. I, I think it's because we're Canadian, Jason. We're <laughs> just so damn nice. We are yeah, so that's what nice. it is. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I can only give you four stars. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Apologizing in the review. <laughs> Oh, oh no, I'm sorry. You go first. No, no, I'm yes, sorry. You okay, go first. no. Can I go you. now? Can I go now, Jason? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, no, seriously, I, we must have gone to the same school of review writing because I'm very much like you. I am. Um, so. Yeah, if I, if, I re- you know, if I read it and I like it, I'll give it five star. It's rare that I give a three star and I won't review it if, I, if, I, if it's really awful. And the main reason is because... Maybe because I, I know how hard it is as a writer right. to get um, a really bad review. And how how am I helping this writer by giving them an awful review that's out there in the public? I may, what I would do actually, is actually send a note to the writer personally, if I have their email, and just say, you know, I, I like the book. Um, however, here are some whatever issues that you may want to deal with, or this is what I think you could improve upon. And perhaps I would only do that if I had a relationship that was amenable to that. If it's not, then I I just don't bother to review it. But I think reviews are helpful. Bad reviews are not helpful. So I would tend not to leave one if it's an awful book. And so, yeah, yeah, four and five stars are usually my my go-to. You know, I and I don't leave bad reviews either. Um, Just want to make clear on that. but I do great things. I, I was briefly a college instructor, so maybe that's where I get this. But maybe I should lean that direction because, yeah, you think as a writer I'd be more understanding and more forgiving of things and just and not so picky. And maybe I need to work on that. And let's see, I'm an American, and you know we're not as polite. <laughs> um, yeah, less that's... less said about well, Americans I... these days, right? Oh dear. Can I address the elephant in this conversation, though? I, I sure. think that's really rude. But I right. I feel <laughs> I feel strongly about this. I feel like there are so many poorly written books. Oh, I feel man. like the vast majority of books, both independent and traditionally published, the vast majority are simply not very good. And I think the ratio of good to bad is about the same as it was ten years ago. There's just more. There are more books, but the same, roughly the same percentage are just not very good. Opinions. Eden? Well, I yes, I would probably say <laughs> You're being very careful. I love it. Um, My Canadian compadre. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking that yeah, there's there's just a lot more out there. So maybe it maybe it takes a lot more to find the good amongst all the bad. Really you know, so um yes, there's a lot of bad stuff out there. There's a lot more bad stuff. I'm I'm thinking there might be a lot more bad stuff out there because we were not flooded with the in the market maybe ten years ago like we are now. It just was not as accessible. Well, I don't know. That's it's so easy to press to press the publish button now. So easy yeah, for anybody who's got who's written something down to just put it out. Yeah. 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 And I think unfortunately that kind of waters down the, the good stuff a little bit and it makes People think that, you know, just because you're an indie writer and you can get your stuff out there, it's like the the, the reputation of vanity presses, you know, it's just right. not all that great. And, you know, unfortunately, that works against people who do work hard to put out a, a good product and they're whether they're indie or traditional, it's just much harder for an indie writer writer to do so. Yeah, I love that. I think you're both right on that. And I, it's, I, I compare it to podcasting, too. I I've always been an early adopter, obviously, on indie publishing, but on podcasting. I started podcasting um, 2006, I think. Off and on, I've had three or four different shows. and um, Not that my shows were incredible by any means, um, as far as production values and things like that. I, I do my best, but there is now such a plethora of just really crappy podcasts out there. And it's just dudes, just usually dudes, just verbal diarrhea and not interesting and need an editor and maybe some sound design and maybe edit out, I don't know, half the ums and ahs if they could, you know, those kinds of things, which drive me crazy as a listener. 
it's it's really interesting to see that because I think it's a direct correlation to what's or maybe not a correlation, but it's a direct kind of it's very similar to what's going on with indie publishing because I think yeah, like you both said, you can it's so easy to push publish now, and I get hit up by writers who maybe aren't bad writers but definitely aren't ready for prime time yet who want me to read their stuff and give my notes and things like that and a few of them this is what's interesting is the, the ones who I give notes to and there's some some notes about real changes. Uh, this is how you know the difference between somebody who's really serious about it. If if they don't, if they act kind of put up, put out by your changes, I think they're not in it quite the same way we are. Yeah, if but if they do what 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 Eden did, which is offer some sincere, hey, I'm a writer. I've been writing for a long time. I've seen some things here. I think you might want to work on these things, or just a suggestion kind of thing. And then they, whether they make the changes or not, the fact that they, how they receive it, is a good indicator. I think so. I I think that's right. And I guess the question I have about this part is, is it ever going to let up? Is it going to be kind of like podcasting? I think, you know, podcasting, uh, I think we're going to see a lot of these shows give up and go away and we'll get back down to kind of a reasonable number. I'm wondering, do you think indie publishing will just continue to have the same level of output from everybody? Just whoever wants to take that on? Um, I, I I think it's already falling off. Um I mean, I started back in 2010, 2011. Yep. So, you know, I've been at it now for almost a decade, and I've already seen a lot of the writers whom I either connected with on um, one forum or another. And they don't, they no longer have a blog, or they no longer write, or they haven't published in a while. So, you know, I think people either they they're in it for the long run, or they maybe it was just a hobby, or or who knows? I don't know what the their their motivation was when they started writing. So I, I think it's um I think it's what they say, you know, writing is just it's not a sprint. What's that? What's that saying again? It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Marathon. So, you know, you have to be in it for for a while. It's not like you're going to make your millions immediately, as most people think about writing, if ever. You know, it's just it's something that you want to do because you love it. And it's hard work, and you're going to keep at it because you you want to do it. So um, maybe the cream will rise to the top, and it might take a long time to get there. But you know, that's that's how I sort of see it. What do you think, Jason? I I agree. I don't see a lot of names in my social media feeds and commenting on blogs and out there in the world. I don't see a lot of the same names I saw nine, ten years ago. There was a lot of people. I don't know if it was a bucket list thing, like. A, I right. I I see those authors. I could write a book, and they go and they do it, and then they realize, well, you have to sell it, and it has to be good, and it has to meet a certain level of quality for readers to keep recommending it to other readers. And maybe they couldn't keep up that that pace or that level of quality, or maybe they just simply checked it off their bucket list and said, you know what, I did that. I wrote a book, and one's good enough, and and one or two is good enough, and here I go. I'll do something else. So. Yeah, um, the names that I do see, however, here's the thing, the names that I continue to see on book covers and, and out on the internet and in the world that I, that I saw in 2009, 2010, 2011, they're actually doing very well. Many of them that have stuck with it are selling books. Many of them are uh, leaving behind their full-time work to oh. make writing their full-time work. That's happened a lot to people that we... Uh, the three of us knew um, eight, nine, ten years ago. I think that's fabulous. I agree. I think it's, uh, I always had to admire the people who started writing because they loved it, but they also held on to a full-time job and then succeeded so much in, in their writing that they gave up the full-time job, which perhaps they never wanted to be doing anyway, and uh, went on to write full-time. So I, I think that is, that's a sign of someone who's succeeded and and continues to to make writing something that's you know uh central to to their life and those are the ones who will stick at it uh, to to do better so I, I i fully agree jason i think that's a great um analysis of those who will who will continue with writing yeah every time i think i'm i'm done which does not happen a lot but there was a there was a couple of times when I thought, uh, you know, this is so much work. And I, I run my own company during the day and got a family and I've got stuff to do just like everybody else. And 
but I, I, I just hear the siren song. I hear the call and I just want to tell my stories and, and, uh, have that satisfaction, even if I don't sell a ton of books. And I never, by the way, I've never sold a ton of books. I've done all right, but I, I, it's the satisfaction of knowing that as best I could do, it's a story well told. And I know for a fact it's entertained people. So that's a lot for me, but that's not to say that I wouldn't love it if, if they got discovered and just, <laughs> you know, even sold mid midlister level, like my grandpa's stuff that, you know, I may have mentioned previously, you know, he wrote Westerns for 50 years and he, he made mid midlister money. He was never, he couldn't quit his day job, but he made a nice supplement to his, to his life or money. So that was nice. Well, I don't want to drag this out too far. I know you've both been so generous to be, be with me, but I would like to just ask then, all that said, since we're not quitting, right? I assume we're all three going to keep going, right? Yeah. Right. Well, I, I was going to interject and ask you both: Have you ever quit, or have you ever, Alex? You've you've admitted that you've thought of it. Mm -hmm. ha have either of you? Because I know that I have come very, very close to quitting at least publishing. I definitely have. You know, life gets crazy. Uh, family members uh, have challenges, and life changes, and things get bigger and bigger and, and crazier. And you, you wake up one day and you say, at least for me, I say, well, I'm always going to be a storyteller. I'm always going to write. But am I going to go through that whole process I described in last week's podcast about the writing process, which is agonizing, and then the editing and, and honing process, and then the design process, and then the marketing process, and then listening to negative reviews and, and all the stuff that goes with it. Am I going to do that? I've, I've woken up on days and said, I'm not going to do that. Now, I didn't quit, and I hope I never do, but have you guys ever gotten to that point? I have gotten to the point where I've stopped writing for a while. It's not because I did not want to write. It's because of, you know, different things happening in my life that I could not write, and it was just a struggle and difficult. And I don't want to label it as writer's block or whatever. I mean, you could call it whatever you like. It was just a period where I could not write. I could not read. You know, my mind was just not there. Um, so I think we're all going to go through periods where it's difficult in any of that, that writing process, which is so long, as you described it, Jason, where we may at one, one part of it decide we can't, I can't do this anymore. So um, thankfully, I'm back on track. I'm writing again. So I definitely do see that that light at the end of the tunnel will be always to write and publish write and publish and you know what happens after the publication is done I don't know maybe it will sell maybe not but a lot of it is going to be based on what I do with it afterwards so I would love to continue the process for as long as I can because it's what I've made my my career doing since I quit banking so um, I, I hope to be able to continue with it. Well, I hope you do too. And I, I went through a period, uh, listeners to the show know I won't retread all that, where I was just not well, uh, physically unwell for a better part of a year. And I muddled thinking, just wasn't in good shape, and just couldn't quite get over the hump. Anything I tried to write was just, uh, so I just put it all down and uh, kind of kept the marketing machine going as best I could, but I just wasn't ready. And then I started feeling better, and Jason knows this, and then all of a sudden I'm, I'm, I'm at the other end of... Uh, FaceTime with Jason going, okay, I need new covers and I need this and I'm going to podcast on a weekly basis. And I'm sure he was thinking, oh my God, cocaine's a wonderful drug, Alex. But uh, no, I'm just kidding about the cocaine. <laughs> sure. Mostly. But, <laughs> but, but I did. And so uh, my, my thought now is, is it's so I love how healthy, Eden, what you just said, what, what a healthy perspective that is. You're going to write and you're going to publish. And, you know, once it's out of your hands, you'll, you'll do your best to keep it in front of people. But, People are going to pick it up or they're not. or uh, And so I like that. And I, I like the idea of telling myself, you know, you're writing for yourself without rationalizing, but I'm writing for myself and I want to entertain people and I will do that. But as lo I find that as long as I tell myself this book you just finished is not a lottery ticket that's going to win necessarily. If it does, great. But uh, to me, the reward can't be monetary at this point. And maybe I'm not thinking about it correctly, but uh, just knowing the way I'm wired, I can't think about this as this one's got to sell. I just can't do that. I, and, and Eden, does that make sense to you or? No, it absolutely makes sense. I mean, I've, I haven't published a book now in, I think it's been almost three years. I've, I've put out different books, novellas, but I haven't actually published in my, my series. And yet each month I'm still getting royalties. So 
I'm thinking, wow, this isn't a bad thing, you know, to be getting paid, but actually not having published anything new. So it just, perhaps it gives me a little bit of confidence to say that, you know, the stuff that I put out there earlier is still keeping me afloat. And if I were to put out a new book, that would sort of revitalize, you know, some of the old catalog and, you know, maybe gain more readers and the whole bit. And that's the way it is. It's like this machine that you just don't want to, you know, dry up, obviously. But um, let's, let's try, if I can, to keep it going. And I feel like, you know, once I get out the next book, it, it, it makes me happier that I'm you know, have output. It's certainly not that I think, oh, this is the this is the book that's going to launch me into to stardom or or wealth or or anything. It's just the book that's going to keep me going, and that's as far as I can. That's as far as I'm going to look. Right, Jason. On a, on a tangent to that, I have noticed this about myself: when I'm not writing, when I don't get a daily word count, I'm a beast. Yeah, you I'm are. I'm not. I am not a pleasant man to be around, despite being a Canadian. I'm I'm impolite, and I don't apologize when I need to. If I haven't gotten my two thousand words in a day, it's it's really true. So, whether uh, you know whether I sell a thousand books or one book, uh, I have to keep. I I know that I have to keep going to get that book out, and if I don't, I'm a nasty, nasty person. You're definitely definitely a nasty person. I want to go on record and say that. Yeah. I'm the least pleasant man that you've ever met. I know it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you should get a uh, endorsement deal for being the least pleasant man alive. I think that would be great. I could. What could I sell with that? Uh, well, let's just try books. Okay. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I never thought of that. Maybe yeah. that's maybe that's one of my challenges. I think maybe you yeah. should think about it. Okay. We. I know we've got to wrap this up. <laughs> I, I want to ask one more question, and I, I'll preface this really quick. And I'm going to I'm going to defer and, and ask Eden this question first, but. Um, I, I want to say this, and this is not me blowing smoke up anybody's ass to tell you that, that Eden writes incredibly good stuff. And uh, at first she started erotica. That's why I first read Eden's work. I read your work, Eden. And I was here, I'm talking to you like you're not here. I'm talking to the readers and listeners and all these people. Okay, I've got to talk to you now, Eden. I started reading your work when it was the erotica work, and it was some of the finest erotica I've ever read. And I was just so excited about it. And I was telling everybody about it. And I loved it. And you, you did a, a, a series of it, a lot of good books and stories and I was so impressed and, well, frankly, intimidated. But also, um, then you switched gears and you jumped over to my side of the street. And you, with your, your Kate Hampton book, you, you started with Stranger at Sunset, which, and I've told you this before, Eden, one of the most incredible murder scenes I've ever read. I was so moved by how well that was done and how I was so in the middle of that scene and that book. And I just really really impressed and I can't wait to see what happens with the next one so that said what are you working on well thank you so much for that I mean I my heart is like so nice and warm and I'm sitting on my couch here and I'm feeling like wow my I've got to push my head back you know like (laughs) it just expanded like to three times its size but I so appreciate your kind words Alex because it was really hard to to think back to when I was starting to write an erotica, whether it was good, not good. And I never expected actually men to be my major, the main readers of my books in some, for, for some time, I think there were more men reading my erotica than there were women. So that was always a a little bit interesting, but um, just to answer your question, I, when I left erotica to move into a suspense writing, I always knew that erotica was just sort of a, jumping off point for me I loved I loved the genre but I knew I wasn't going to be writing it forever so I'm writing the series I called it the stranger series so the first book was stranger at sunset with Kate Hampton and the second book which I'm writing on right now is called the fragile truce which just continues her story and um, hopefully that will come out very very soon so that's what I'm working on listeners keep it here because I know for a fact that my friend Eden will let me know when it's going to come out. Are you going to, if you don't mind, if you don't want to tell me or you haven't thought about it when you get it done, are you going to do a pre-order, do you think, or, or a launch of that some sort? Be, yeah, that would be, um, that'd be the thinking, I think, you know, to do some sort of pre-order, especially for those who, who've read the first book and, and want to know about it ahead of time. So, you know, the marketing is, is 
for me the last part of it. Right. But yes, I should definitely keep my eye on that. If you think about it, when you know you're about 30 days out, let me know and I'll do some, some, I'll tell my audience about it and get them all fired up about it and we'll put links everywhere and I'll go spray paint them on sides of buildings, whatever you need. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. J Mac, my brother, what are you working on? Firstly, I have to echo, Alex, what you said about your original erotica work, Eden. Um, I remember I met you first and we conversed a bit and you were in the community and you were very nice and fellow Canadian. And, um, and then I went and read your work and I, I admit to being a bit hesitant because it was erotica and I had not read anything like that. I can be perfectly honest, other than, other than uh, you know, pop fiction that had some intimacy or sex in it i hadn't i hadn't really read anything yours was the first yours was my first eden yours wow was my first i am yeah. so honored you did. yeah right and um i was very impressed with the writing and uh and so i was i continued to read everything you put out and then when you switched over to to the the sus- suspense thriller genre i think i was even more impressed and less um self-conscious to to <laughs> I'm being perfectly honest here. I, I think I was less self-conscious to read that, even though there was some steam and a little bit in in the, those books. And so that's I find that interesting how writers can jump and move from genre to genre, often with fluidity if if they're good writers. And I think you've done that. I think there was a fluidity to how you kind of moved from the er- 